Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to have everyone here about a really um, important conversation. Um, we haven't gathered our community in a while, so I really appreciate everyone coming together. Uh, we're a community of doers and solutionists to address our rapidly um, declining planet and also rapidly thawing permafrost, which we are to talk about today. Uh, at Grounded, we really believe in a confluence of Earth-based solutions and solutionists that are addressing our biosphere and the health of all of humanity and our planet. Um, so we are really happy to be here and I have a really great lineup of amazing human beings who are um, addressing not only rapidly thawing permafrost, but um, also um, the decline of our biosphere. And we're really excited to introduce all of them to you today. Uh, there will be breakout rooms um, that will be happening at the end. So be sure to tune in with each speaker. If you really like what they're saying, you can tune in and um, uh, have a, a breakout room with each of them. So without further ado, really excited to talk about um, permafrost. Um, we have uh, rapidly thawing permafrost, which is um, releasing a lot of methane and CO2 into our atmosphere. If we're lo to lose just 10% of permafrost, that would mean 75 parts per million in the atmosphere. And so it's a huge feedback loop that needs um, urgent action and conversation. And so not only will we be talking about um, rapidly thawing permafrost, we'll also be talking about the solutions to address it. So thank you so much for tuning in and happy to hand it over to Gail Whiteman. I'm on mute as well. Hi, everybody. Gail Whiteman here. I think, thank you very much, Julia. I think we're going to actually watch a trailer first, and then I'm going to introduce the panel. Thank you. Permafrost, it's called the ticket and time bomb. These top layers of permafrost store more organic carbon than all above ground vegetation of the planet. What happens in the Arctic unfortunately does not stay in the Arctic. When that carbon is released into the atmosphere, the consequence of that is that we accelerate climate change. And so we enter this sort of vicious cycle. The way to mitigate carbon is to develop soils with animals. We can restore the ecosystem the way it used to be. The long-term goal is to get this ecosystem to help us mitigate climate change in the future. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gail Whiteman here. I'm the executive director of Arctic Base Camp, and I'm thrilled to be moderating what is really a rock star panel. Now, some of you in the audience might not know a lot about permafrost, but you're going to learn a lot about it today. And there's no better week to kick off, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the UN Climate Week to actually talk about one of the biggest threats that are facing humanity. Now, there's a lot of permafrost out there. It covers about 25% of the Earth's uh, surface in the, in, the, um, uh, in the polar regions. And it's got about two times of the amount of carbon that we have in, uh, in the atmosphere. So it's a big issue. And uh, my panel is going to tell us a lot more about both the science and the solutions. And I'd like each of them to very briefly introduce themselves and give me one fun or not so fun fact about permafrost. Carl, can we start with you? Hi, everybody. Uh, Carl Burkhart, the Deputy Director of One Earth. Uh, we funded a lot of research in this space and uh, in general uh, towards better understanding our global climate system and how we can avert a climate crisis. The fun fact, uh, on permafrost, there's three, I'll just leave it as a teaser. There's three types of permafrost emissions and you're gonna learn about that today. Wow, I, I'm not even sure I know the answer to that one, Carl. Thank you. Okay, Rachel, what's your, who are you? And what's your fun or not so fun fact? Hi, um, yeah, I'm Rachel. I'm a researcher at Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, and yeah, I focus on um, permafrost thaw and fire and what those things mean for international climate goals. Um, and I have gone for a fun fact, uh, which is that the oldest known DNA um, was found in the Siberian permafrost. It came from a mammoth tooth and it's over, mi over a million years old. Wow, that is actually a fun fact. I hope we get a couple more fun facts before we get the not so fun facts. 
Um, uh, Dolma, can we have you on screen, please? Hi, thank you for having me today. I'm Dolma. I'm uh, heading Live Barefoot Fund at Vivo Barefoot, a footwear company with a mission to reconnect people into the natural world. Um, fun fact is um, I was born and raised in Siberia. And every time I say that, people say, oh, my God, you're probably really good at uh, sort of uh, living in uh, cold conditions. I am wearing really warm jacket because I'm sitting outside. So the secret of surviving in Siberia is actually how you dress up. So it's, uh, you know, not like <laughs> any kind of special superpower. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, well, it is if you don't know how to do it. I'm a Canadian, so I think our climate's pretty close to Siberia uh, in the boreal forest. So thank you for that. Olya, can you join us on stage? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Olya, and I'm the CEO of Frost Methane. Uh, we tackle concentrated methane emissions from both the permafrost and not from the permafrost. Um, and a fun fact is um, I was in the permafrost research tunnel um, outside of Fairbanks just a couple of weeks ago, and it was super interesting for me to see um, some of the biomass that gets preserved, including the chlorophyll. So like some of the grass is still green um, underneath. That's it. That is a, that's a very fun fact. We hope you can circulate some photos of that after Olya. Okay, to kick off the panel, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the new IPCC report, the AR6. Now, that's certainly been called the code red for humanity. And there's a lot of alarming uh, and concerning facts in that. And of course, that's good timing in front of the UN climate meetings in November in Glasgow. But Carl, you are the only person that said to me, you actually felt really optimistic when you read that report, please tell us why. Okay, well, maybe to caveat, I don't know if I feel optimistic, but I actually didn't see, uh, I saw some good news mixed in with the bad news. And um, maybe we could we put that, they're letting me put up one slide. We're trying to keep it conversational, but but they're, I've got one very packed slide, which we're, it's very wonky and it, it, it takes an hour to go over it, but we can share it later with all of you. But. Um, on the left, the thing that I was happiest about is that on the left, we have a new came one of the global assessment reports. So this is this IPCC six assessment. Um, we're going to have chapter two and chapter three or working group two and three coming out in a bit. Working group one is about physics. And um, for a very long time, it did not include permafrost or other uh, bio, but we call them biosphere feedbacks. So on the left there, we have a new table, which is uh, called the biogeochemical feedbacks in the climate system. And if you look at the bottom chart, we've got permafrost in there, both uh, CO2 and um, CH4, so methane and carbon dioxide. Um, so it's in, which was very um, important for us because we've been working for a very, very long time and having um, biosphere feedbacks acknowledged in the climate model in the climate models. And so now they are, and it's now officially part of the IPCC. This table, um, I think we're going to find out is probably not adequate to reflect all of the emissions, but it's a really good start. And now we have a platform to stand on. So I think that's the, the silver lining I saw. Another little bit of silver lining is that in the, in the second chart, there, um, there's actually there, there's slightly more optimism about the resilience of forest under 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Um, they look like the be pretty stable. So that was a bit of good news. On the right is a climate model we're developing now, which again, we'll share later, but it just shows that even with a much lower carbon budget and permafrost um, emissions factored in, we um, believe we can still achieve the 1.5 C goal. So I'll leave it at that for now. But um, yeah, so definitely a warning. It is a code red, but there's also some, some um, good nuggets in there as well. Well, thanks. Thanks, thanks Carl. Thanks, Carl. I think that that actually, it makes a ton of sense to me. And I think having permafrost finally in the IPCC report really will send a signal to policymakers that this is an important and scientifically rigorous uh, uh, risk factor for humanity. So I think I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, now, I want to ask Rachel a question. So if we can bring the rest of the panelists back on. Rachel, you know, you're on the front lines of climate research. Uh, you know everything there is to know about permafrost. <laughs> and, uh, you know, t tell us about the, the short term and the long term uh, impacts of, uh, uh, of this thaw. Yes, um, sure. So I guess one of the first thing I sort of get sort of following on a little bit um, from Carl is that uh, you sort of mentioned, I know everything there is to know about permafrost permafrost law, which of course is very much not the case, much as I would like it to be the case. Um, and one of the, um, also I guess part of the reason for that is 
that there is there is just a lot more work to do that we have to do as a scientific community. So that work that's been done to put permafrost into the AR6, the IPCC report, um, it's fantastic that that is in there. It is really great news. But I think this alludes again a little bit to um, to Carl's fun fact as well. So there is actually only one component of permafrost thaw that is factored into those carbon budgets in the new IPCC report. Um, so permafrost thaw includes gradual thaw, which is this slow sort of centimetre by centimetre, year to year process where essentially the top layer of, of the ground that does thaw thickens. We also have abrupt thaw, um, which is when we sort of see these, this lar these larger scale processes, things like ground collapse, these sort of big dramatic photos we see a lot when we talk about permafrost. And there's also the impacts of, of fire on, um, on permafrost. And none of those things, abrupt thaw or the impacts of fire, are factored in yet. So we know that um, that inclusion of permafrost thaw in the IPCC report is an underestimate, but unfortunately we don't know by how much. Um, but to go back to sort of your question about, um, I think again, you, you mentioned the word front lines and um, in terms of impact, I guess the the people really sort of on the front lines of this issue are of course the around 4 million people who live across the Arctic. And um, we have to recognize that permafrost thaw is having very real, very tangible impacts um, across the Arctic right now. So we have to remember that in the Arctic, ice is infrastructure. So as permafrost thaws, the ground is literally moving and collapsing and we can imagine the impacts that has on, on people's homes, on infrastructure, on the ability to travel around, um, all these things. Uh, but as well, we know these things have, have global implications. So that is essentially that um, permafrost thaw will um, accelerate climate change, possibly is already accelerating climate change. So we need deeper, faster mitigation to reach the same goals. Um, and we also have the fact that those emissions that we're triggering now will continue for centuries. So we're also, um, there's that longer term sort of intergenerational impact as well. Sure, sure. But I'm, I, I'm gonna push you a little bit here uh, and, and Carl, feel free to jump in in a second. How much of a risk is this? So it's it, it could amplify climate change. Uh, it, there's certainly feedback loops. There's certainly um, regional impacts for uh, folks that are living in the Arctic. But, but, you know, if permafrost is so important for the future of humanity, what kind of scale are we really looking at here? There's a ton of carbon uh, stored in permafrost. Uh, how worried are you? Yeah, it's a great, it's the key question, of course, isn't it? And um, the first thing I have to say, annoyingly, is that there is just so much that goes into answering that question that we don't know, which sounds crazy. You know, we've had a long time working on this, but the Arctic is a big, uh, remote, challenging to work in region. And the monitoring that needs to be happening is, is just not happening at the moment. There's no, we haven't got it happening at scale. We don't have um, enough temporal data or spatial data. And we also have to remember that already we're in a climate that humanity has never experienced before. So we have no precedent for what is happening now. It's a very hard thing to try and unravel and understand. Right, right. Um, but if, I, if I'm going to, so Carl, I'm going to go over to you for a second here. If I need a soundbite uh, uh, for Joe Biden's administration uh, uh -huh. this week, um, you know, how worried should uh, Mr. Biden and team be worried about permafrost? Uh, should they be staying up at night? Uh, they should definitely be worrying more about it. Uh, and I think uh, Rachel um, knows that the Woodwell Research Center, where we were really happy to support a very important scientific effort there um, in, the, in the middle of to look at compiling these different types of emissions because there's different types. They also may interact with each other. There's a lot of uncertainty, but Woodwell is out there on the front lines uh, moving and advancing the science. So that paper, I think, will help a lot in some of these um, discussions. North America and Russia and China, a lot of the big emitter, like well, Canada, as well, I'll have a lot of exposure to their targets. Um, you know, they're sort of on, uh, just last night I was in an event, John Kerry announced, you know, that they got the world's leading economies on board with 50, 55% uh, of the GDP is gonna achieve net zero, but they are not factoring in uh, releases um, of either carbon dioxide or methane from the Arctic properly, uh, in our opinion. I think that roughly on the chart there, I think we probably need to, roughly double that but uh rachel probably like hopefully will be correcting me <laughs> when the new paper comes out um but yeah it's very worrisome but um again we you know when i say like who's on the front lines there's so many indigenous and, and community groups that we really need to think about there's actual communities sinking 
right Absolutely. now. Um, oh, okay, so I'm going to, Carl, line. I'm just going to interrupt here. I'm actually going to uh, uh, turn over to Dolma here because you're from Siberia. You're from the front lines. So, so as opposed to us saying what's going on in the front lines, how about you tell me the kind of impacts that you've seen uh, in your uh, home community? I know you don't live there now, but you've been there recently. And how worried are, are uh, local people? Yeah, so um, I, I'm from a uh, um, tribe called the uh, indigenous tribe called Buryat. So it's uh, it's not quite yet the Arctic uh, indigenous community, but it's very close. Uh, we are more towards um, we're basically the first inhabitants of Lake Baikal, but we still get uh, uh, minus forty degree Celsius winters and plus forty <laughs> degree summers. And then I've been home um, last month. Uh, for two weeks with my two kids, and uh, we ended up uh, cutting the trip short because we haven't didn't see the sun for uh, the entire trip, because was all the whole sky was covered um, in uh, uh, Siberian uh, forest fires. So one of the sort of obviously this like I've never been in the middle of a crisis like this uh, in my life. Like as far as I remember, all my childhood uh, we had pretty normal good summers, extremely beautiful winters. And then this time it's incredibly uh, devastating to see that. So there are sort of three main uh, uh, things that I wanted to flag today, obviously uh, starting with Siberian fires. Uh, so far, the how Greenpeace uh, puts it, uh, about 21 million hectares of pristine forest uh, went under fire this season alone. Uh, and then the fire is basically starting early and earlier. And it does have direct relationship with uh, the Arctic Circle. So since uh, all the um, hottest uh, uh, um, summer has been uh, um, recorded uh, in, Ju on, in June uh, this year, but at the same time, the temperature in winter went to like 67 degrees. So basically the whole, uh, I think the local population now even don't know like when uh, do they need to kind of um, plant, uh, when do they start the farming. It's like the whole timetable went uh, off, off the charts. My family are the farmers, so I can see how uh, um, flash flooding is now happening. And it also wasn't a very normal thing like before. And uh, Yeah, and then uh, it's all related, uh, like the whole ecosystem obviously interconnected. So with the Siberian fires and uh, what I've seen now um, in my hometown, it's pretty shocking so uh, also what uh, um, yeah in terms of temperatures the temperature how I understand in Nordic Russia the temperature is now increasing faster than in the rest of the world uh, that obviously also affects uh, the rainfalls so moving from uh, the Siberian fires as a kind of the obvious problems that I saw right now there are other thing around the methane gas builds that we um, already it has been mentioned that uh, like basically the ground is moving so you never know when your home is going to disappear so obviously it's very scary on daily basis uh, the third uh, uh, impact uh, um, on the population we're having right now is obviously food security um, so um, yeah since uh, uh, obviously my, fam my family are the farmers and uh, it's uh, it's um, yeah we just don't know like how how to plan for future it's like really hard to tell there are like uh, not much uh, technologies are being deployed it's like whole uh, uh, range of uh, not just governmental international support here is required obviously the language barriers is a uh, number one like i obviously go and uh, try to support them uh, with uh, our cooperatives that we have but in general it's just like um, how do you approach it like uh, everything is tightly interconnected uh, like our traditional food health culture it's like in the mix with uh, all this uh, the climate change situation it's um yeah it does need a, a massive consolidated approach and then obviously also russian government is not that easy to work with um funding is another issue um uh yeah and then how do you organize something that would be how I call it a global approach. Yeah. yeah. Global but local. Excellent, um, excellent, yeah. excellent point, Dalma. So it, you know, it's pretty clear that there are, uh, people, just ordinary people in the Arctic, are seeing a lot of changes that are happening. Why should the rest of us around the world really, really care? I'm going to come back to the what are the global impacts that actually we're uh, feeling locally, whether we're in San Francisco or we're in London or we're in um, Athens. How does this affect the rest of us? Who wants to tackle that? I throw that open to uh, any any of you, actually. 
extreme weather, is it related at all to some of the changes we're seeing? I guess I can jump in um, and Please just do. say quickly, I mean, you mentioned um, extreme weather, and I think that's, um, I guess, for all of us really around the world, that's one of the most sort of tangible impacts um, of climate change, which of course is linked to permafrost thawing that, that will be accelerated. And um, the first thing that made me think of was, of course, the um, the heat dome um, that's experienced in British Columbia. And um, I had a very sort of strange moment um, trying to get in touch with elderly vulnerable relatives out there and um, sort of I get, and also I sort of feel guilty saying that because I think God it's so privileged isn't it that that was the first time I felt really personally afraid because of climate change but you know I think those those are the kind of impacts that all of us around the world see more of um, obviously it depends so much on um, yeah I guess on your on your level of privilege you know there's also the things like food prices um, and yeah it's those the day-to-day -day kind of um threat and risk multiplier um effects that climate change has i think which are the most tangible for for all of us yeah i agree i, I liked what you said in the film clip that we saw rachel which is what happens in the arctic doesn't stay in the arctic and i think whether we like it or not uh you know when we are experiencing extreme weather or fires out uh, the west coast of the u.s and the, the western part of canada the, these are certainly related to climate change and are being uh, increasingly tied to some of the changes that are happening in the Arctic, not necessarily a permafrost per se, but also loss of summer sea ice. So I think it's an interconnected system and the Arctic is clearly uh, a barometer of global risk. So let's try and get into solutions. Uh, Olya, you've got an amazing uh, idea that's, well, it's beyond an idea. Tell us about some solutions you think you may have. <laughs> um yeah, hi. Um, so we're focusing on concentrated methane emissions out of the Arctic, which is, um, at least to my knowledge, a slightly more recently characterized phenomena compared to the diffuse ones. And so we find these really concentrated methane emissions and we install devices on them to burn the methane. So I know it's super counterintuitive to be like tackling climate change with fire, but methane over like a hundred year time scale absorbs more heat, 28 times more heat than CO2. Burning it is a really, really, really low cost way of turning that methane into CO2, right? So we reduce the warming potential by like 96%. Um, so we install devices on top of these methane vents um, that continuously burn it and basically reduce those particular effects. Now, you wouldn't want to do it on diffuse methane, right? You don't want to cover the entire Arctic in like a giant sheet of plastic and try to burn that, right? Because then you're cutting off the oxygen and probably creating more methane. But when it's coming out of a very, very small area, that's um, actually... Um, a reasonably good solution. And so okay, so see, two, mm -hmm. two questions. Yeah. How do you find the vents? And how have you tested this to actually see if this has got a net positive uh, um, impact rather than a it's getting worse kind of thing? This, so yeah. tell us that. Yeah, so, um, so there's two ways. So the major way is uh, there's lots of researchers, um, Katie Walter Anthony from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. We work with her group really closely. Um, to find specifically bubbling lakes, like lakes that, that have a methane vent underneath them. Uh, there's other ones in Siberia that have been really well documented. Um, and so, so far we're using, we're working with the academic community. The second way to do that, which is a little further out in our future is satellite imagery analysis, because when it's happening under lakes, those lakes don't freeze or, or a portion of it. And that's very well visible in visual satellites. Um, where there is some really, really good data out there as opposed to trying to do it with methane satellites, which right now still don't have the resolution and sensitivity and the kind of data available. Uh, so we're looking at least until the methane satellites get, um, uh, get higher coverage, until then we're gonna be using the visual ones. As far as like, do we know if it's working? Um, so we did install one of these devices. Um, I was in the installation three weeks ago um, in Northern Alaska. Um, so it's working, it's flaring, we're getting data back through satellite communication systems that this is uh, working. And by working, I mean, it's turning methane into CO2 so we can tell the combustion process. Um, and then as far as like, does that make things better? Like it is a, in, in many places, like in carbon markets and you know, oil and gas has to flare because flaring is better than just letting it go. So it's pretty well established that turning methane into CO2 is, um, is a positive for the climate. 
Okay, well, we'll have to stay tuned on that. We need to take a little bit more research, perhaps, to to convince me. But I think it's a really innovative innovative approach to actually dealing with with something in in the crisis moment when it's when it's uh, venting off. But there's got to be other solutions. Now, Carl, uh, I want to switch over to you. You've done a ton of work in this space. Um, you know, you've got your finger on the pulse of many of the solutions that the the world is talking about through your role at One Earth and previously that at the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. So, tell us what you think are some of the solutions to, I guess, not just the permafrost thaw, but the whole climate change mix? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I have a boring answer, I guess, which is that, you know, we the main solution is to absolutely limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And uh, we believe actually the, the concept of tipping points, I should have mentioned, that's another concept that was introduced. So this was a super important report that just came out from the IPCC, but tipping points are, we're going to learn a lot more about them in the next 10 years. And we're it's going to become very clear that 1.5C really is the limit. It's still not clear to a lot of people that there's still this sort of below 2C. And, um, you know, I feel like I spent the majority of past two decades working on 1.5C. It's, it's gotten more traction now than it ever has, but we have to just make it very clear. That's the absolute line in the sand. We are going to have some emissions release from permafrost, but we can limit it if we keep it to 1.5 C. Great. So we just have to limit it to 1.5 C. How are we, how are we going to get there? What do you think, Rachel? I think um, the <laughs> sort of innovative solutions that we talk about um, are tools in the toolbox. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think the number one thing, of course, that we have to do is we have to cut emissions. We have to stop burning fossil fuels and do these sort of large scale changes that will cut global emissions. And really, if we if we don't do those things, um, then we will not fix this. And what what do you think is the uh, what's your message, I guess, for Boris Johnson? I know you're at Woodwell, but you're also, I think, located in the UK and I hear an English accent. So what should <laughs> yes, you Mr. Mr. Johnson be doing since he is hosting <laughs> the, the, the UN climate meetings uh, very soon? There's a lot of things I'd like to say to Boris Johnson, but um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if he's listening. He might be. He might be. <laughs> but I think actually, I think the more powerful thing would be to say to um, to uh, to everyone, I guess, is that, you know, regardless of where you're located, like the most powerful thing, in my opinion, that you can do is use your voice. You know, we've had this history of sort of being shamed into not using our voices by this concept of personal carbon footprint and all of this. Um, and reducing your carbon footprint is great, but the most powerful thing you can do is to hold people like your politicians, like your business leaders to account and say, this is your responsibility. What are you doing to fix this? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I could I could not agree more. Now, Dilma, what do you think about adaptation? Um, you know, you're you're from a community that has uh, uh, already experienced the impact of climate change. It's not a future scenario for them. They're struggling uh, now to understand the changes in growing season. It, it, what what is the the take on adaptation? That's got to be part of the solution mix, I would think. Um, I don't have a direct answer to that right now because it's um um. It's obviously all an evolving thing, and I would need like a wider community support to uh, get there. But I can uh, only talk on behalf of the um, our family business, and we're trying to approach it uh, through. Okay, let let's take a step back. So basically, today um, we're on a company uh, family business that's uh, all around. Uh, actually, it's a social business because we basically end up reinvesting all the money into tons of impact projects. Uh, we're all into sustainable production consumption. Um, um, how we can create a tangible example of a regenerative footwear and experiences that brings us closer to nature, but also uh, how we can this become or create this collective or be in the path of creating this collective rising consciousness to thrive in nature. And from our um, sort of uh, philosophy, it all starts with feet, because the feet is the only sort of organ that directly connects to the ground, <laughs> talking about ground being grounded. So, uh, uh, and uh, as part of uh, one of our biggest uh, sort of impact um, uh, programs is actually working with indigenous communities. So I, um, that's why I can't really talk directly about the, the food security, for example, but I can talk about the consumer goods uh, uh, products, in this case, uh, uh, footwear. So example of that would be, we worked with, uh, um, uh, collaborated with the Sami people in Finland, uh, researching on their artisanal shoe making skills. Uh, they are reindeer herds, herders, and they have this amazing product that basically sustains minus 50 degrees. 
Yeah. How on earth we didn't, like the modern manufacturing system ever um, deployed this type of technology, like the, 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 the wisdom that the community generated for many years, but plus on top of it now, since, uh, uh, again, with the climate change, the, all the, uh, obviously the reindeer herds and the t- thunder is changing, the, there is a risk that we're going to have, a, we might lose this type of craftsmanship, like as it was the case in the Kalahari Desert when we work with the Johansi Sun community. So, uh the bottom line is that uh, there is a, the, as a business there is no, like uh, almost like a moral responsibility in wh- whichever industry you're working with to have this direct uh, uh, connection or relationship to have this kind of higher stand morale to support programs and uh, have not, not just like from charitable or all, all this like philanthropic perspective that create a sustainable social businesses that like uh, would go go along even if your funding cut at some point. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, basically what we're trialing out from uh, uh, preserving artisanal sk- skills. Again, like uh, working, making sure that the value chains are there because at the end of the day, it also starts with materials. So there's a, um, a kelp farming uh, project we're running now in south of Devon, like first time ever in U- in England. Uh, there's like a whole... Uh, um, a new uh, sort of artisanal project, even if it's like in a first world country and all of that, but it still um, goes back to how do you create a regenerative value chains across everything where you touch as a business. So how we can, as humanity, live in harmony with nature uh, through whatever product or service you create. Oh, yeah. I think that is incredibly inspirational. I, I, I hope that the heads of FTSE 500 uh, come and take a, a, a day class with you, uh, Dolma, because I think that is absolutely the direction we need to go on. Carl, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit uh, at the global level now, a little bit about the global safety net. I know you're going to talk more in your breakout group, um, but but I'm sure that the whole audience would like to hear a, 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 a definitely a little bit about that. You've had some major wins recently. Yeah, I guess, well, it was the community, but yeah, one, uh, another solution, uh, and I think Rachel touched on energy decarbonization, but the other big one is nature. You know, nature is our biggest ally. We keep kind of fighting it, but it's still trying to help us. And the Global Safety Net was a a multi-year scientific analysis of the world's remaining natural lands that were capable of supporting wildlife. And um, it was an important paper that was released last year that's informed the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which is happening Part one of it is happening in Kunming, China uh, next month. Um, so just a, uh, was it a week ago, <laughs> it's like time is moving very quickly, but um, uh, at the IUCN Congress, which is the big international Congress for conservation scientists, 15,000 members, all the governments represented, a motion was advanced called Motion 101 to protect 50%. So the finding of the global safety net was there's 50% of the world's land is, is still capable of supporting biodiversity and car- storing carbon. And uh, so that was advanced and passed. So now the official recommendation uh, to the UN uh, and all the government parties is that we need to protect 50. Um, so that's that's a big win. A lot, there were um, two major um, indigenous coalitions that really pushed it. And um, uh, Ikoika in Latin America and IPAC in Africa, um, representing I think about 600 indigenous um, tribes altogether. So the momentum's now really gain, gaining um, steam. <laughs> and so that's that's exciting. And you know, so, saving what the nature that we have and actually even restoring nature and reintroducing wild species back into areas that are protected is turning out to be this huge solution, which will be, um, as One Earth, we're gonna be investing in the scientific research around that. Oh, fant- fantastic, congratulations. I think that again is something to give optimism to all of us. Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna I come back to you and you're an entrepreneur. So you've got a business brain uh, coupled with a, a green heart, I, I guess. Um, but what about the investment community? Are you seeing shifts? Uh, are they moving towards solutions? Are they a friend or foe? <laughs> um, yeah, actually the last, um, I would say the last 12 months or so, there's been incredible amount of money flowing into um, all sorts of solutions, right? Like anywhere from clean building materials, right down to like clean cement, hydrogen, you know, various um, various lower impact uh, regenerative ag. Um, so there's been uh, there's been a very large move. Like fundraising, let's say two years ago, and fundraising today are like very very different things. So I think we're going to see um, a large influx of new solutions coming up because of the new funding available. 
Oh, well, well, that's fantastic. And, and best of luck to you as you move forward on uh, that green investment landscape. Well, we're, we're closing in, uh, everybody. Uh, we've got uh, a couple minutes, uh, about five minutes left before we go to the breakout groups. And what I would uh, really like to know is that, you know, I'm scared. I'm scared about permafrost. I have to say that as a, a social scientist and one who, who uh, brings Arctic uh, change into uh, global boardrooms, I'm really worried about it. It's a real wild card. And uh, admittedly, Rachel, we need more data. We need more information. So One Earth uh, and Grounded, good that your funding would well on this. But I do think there's a clear message that it is a very dangerous wild card and we have to get uh, serious about that. And we need solutions, both in terms of innovation uh, potentially uh, uh, on methane uh, flaring and burning. Uh, again, I haven't looked at the data, so I can't say yay or nay on that, but but you're a pretty compelling person, Olya. But I do think it's the cutting uh, of emissions, the real, uh, you know, uh, right. staying within the 1.5 uh, C target. Um, and we have a lot to do uh, uh, this, uh, this November in, in Glasgow at the Conference of the Parties. So what I would like to say is thank you to all of you. But as we close, I'm wondering if we could just take a moment and think personally and professionally, what gives us hope? Dolma, I'd like to start with you. Um, I think we need to fully sort of acknowledge that uh, we are in the middle of really fast paced situation. We're not really like adapted to to this type of uh, anthropological change so i think it's okay to acknowledge that we are basically in a in a mess uh we need to kind of uh, ground it again uh, um, um fully acknowledge it and then kind of just move forward uh, and the one way to do it is uh, keep uh, keep reconnecting back to nature live truly um sort of a uh, um in harmony with nature um question everything you see around it's not that easy right now like with all this media bombardment uh, left right and center you never know actually what's the, the real truth behind the stuff but uh yeah just uh um stay more connected be more human uh, one practical thing you can do right now and i, I probably say that every time i speak is to find your nearest uh, Patch of grass, land, take your shoes off, sit down, connect to the ground, meditate, feel, feel life. And, um, you know, more people will get like together, we can do anything. Um, one of the latest book I uh, got hold of is a hunter gatherer's guide to the 21st century. I had highly recommend it. Um, yeah. Um, beautiful. beautiful. I I'm going to go outside after after we finish with the breakout rooms. But thank you for that, Dolma. I found that very, very, again, inspirational and uh, gave me hope. Carl, what gives you hope? Um, two cans, tapers, wolves, and whales. Because uh, I'm just going to say that there are four of many, many, many species. And the, the scientific research is showing that they're the world's best carbon farmers. Um, and when we actually help them to thrive in their landscapes. They uh, make those landscapes healthier that, and they in turn absorb a lot more carbon. So through wildlife, we can actually remove carbon dioxide instead of giant air, you know, air conditioners in Iceland, we can actually support wildlife to do it at a lot lower cost and a lot bigger benefit. So right now that's what I'm focusing on a lot. Oh, I love it. I love it. And I want to add sea otters into your mix because they, they're in there. Yeah, they're yeah, very important. Yeah, they're great with those kelp kelp farms. Yay. Yay. Sea, sea otters must be my spirit spirit animal. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What gives you hope? Um, so I'm a computer scientist by training. And 10 years ago, when I got into climate work, I was like the only one out of my peers. And the last three years, I've just seen people from all professions kind of stream into climate work in, in a variety of ways, right? Like in nature based solutions and mechanical solutions all over the place. And so the influx of talent is, um, and people to choosing to put their time and, and often their money um, towards this problem, I think is uh, the kind of very, make me very hopeful that uh, we'll get it done. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. If that, Rachel, up to you. Yeah, I, I hate to be this person, um, but I guess from my point of view, I mean, climate change is, we know climate change is here, climate change is here to stay. And I don't feel um, hopeful about that. I guess I don't, I don't really look for help, hope with that. It is a, 
it's not a hopeful situation. Um, but I guess I guess on on the sort of flip side of that, like what I do have, um, I guess is is just to be honest, like a lot of anger. Like I'm very angry about it. When you really think and you really connect with the issues that you're working on, it makes me so angry. You know, we know all the solutions are out there. We know there are people out there with the power to implement them, and yet we've we've not done it. Um, and people are experiencing the impacts of that now. Will be for the rest of our lifetimes. And I think, um, I guess the sort of the positive spin on that is that I think when there are actions that we can take and when we know there's work to do, I think anger can be actually much more motivating than hope. Um, and at least I find that is kind of the thing that keeps me going in a way is, is the rage. So um, I hope that that resonates with a few other people out there. Well, well said though. I suspect that Domo would suggest that you also need to take some time outside to rejuvenate <laughs> yourself because if you get as much gray hair as I have, you'll, 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 you'll have to temper the, the, the anger uh, with some uh, healthy doses of, of hope. <laughs> Julia, I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to say thank you to this rock star panel. Um, I, I guess only to say that what gives me hope is uh, the way the, the world has risen to the COVID pandemic challenge, where we have done the impossible in a very short period of time, uh, despite pushback from many, many different places, including uh, 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 the public in some parts, uh, uh, governments in other parts, um, and just, uh, you know, the, the the whole monster of the, the wicked problem that we saw. And we've seen that we can do it. So that gives me hope too. Julia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. You are such an excellent moderator. Um, thank you to all of you. You all give me hope. Um, Rachel, I could resonate with what you were saying. I lost my home to the Kincaid fire. So living the climate crisis very personally and viscerally, I channeled that, I guess you could say, despair and grief into action. And, and um, I resonated with what Doma was saying about getting grounded, going outside barefoot. So that's actually why I named the organization Grounded, because to really be coherent and to solve the climate crisis within yourself, you have to be grounded energetically. And so um, I believe in what gives me hope is human ingenuity and the human spirit. I think that we can adapt. I think that we are very resilient as a species. Um, I think that as much as we are in a climate crisis, we're also in a moral crisis um, where we've forgotten who we are. So what gives me hope too are the communities on the front lines. Dolma, thank you for all of the work you do, um, but many other indigenous communities that are, are stewarding the last pristine ecosystems on planet Earth. And I think as a species, we can't expect to destroy the planet and and think that technology will solve all of our problems. Of course, we need both, but I'm a fan of nature-based solutions like Global Safety Net, protecting 50% of the planet by 2030. Um, and so I think that we can do it. We've got 8.5 years till 2030. So we've got a short window of time to really solve the climate crisis. But uh, instead of game over, I have the spirit game on. And, and I think all of you do too. Um, so thank you so much for joining this panel everyone and um and we're going to um we're going to actually have breakout rooms now um so you anyone that res if you resonated with any particular speaker you can actually join them and ask them more intimate questions about their work um and yeah we'll see you there so we'll all see you in the breakout room please stay on and and stay tuned and and join with any of the speakers thank you all of you again you guys are rock stars thanks gail <laughs>